Imagine this. You're having an argument with a friend and... Uh, who am I kidding? People don't have friends who they disagree with anymore. Okay, let's try this. Imagine you're having an argument with literally Hitler. You have multiple scientific studies that back up your position, but for one, the response is... How would you respond? Is there such a thing as a good sample size? Can a sample size be too small? Or too big for that matter? Is there some universal standard for a good sample size? Is there something that the internet bullshit artists and propagandists know that peer reviewers for top tier journals don't? All will be revealed in this video. Sample size is extremely important in science and can be the difference between a world-changing discovery and the latest bit of nonsense worthy of mockery. But what is it? A sample size is the size of a portion of things taken from a larger group of things and used to accurately represent that larger group of things. <sighs> it's important to have a good sample size because if you don't, you won't get an accurate representation of the group of things from the smaller randomly selected group of things, if that makes any sense. Let me try this. On the table here, I have 200 M&Ms, and M&Ms, as I'm sure you know, come in many different colors. But of these 200 M&Ms, how many of them are yellow? How many are red or green? I randomly grab one from the bag. Can we conclude that they are all red like this one? No. If I take one and base my judgments off that, then we are still way off. But let's actually do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. There we go. Here. I just grabbed one red M&M, which as we've already determined is not accurate. But how close is it to representing the whole? Of these 10 M&Ms, only one is red, which means that only 10% of these M&Ms are red. Which means that if we grab one that happens to be red, it only represents 10% of the total. Now let's try applying this to the 200 M&Ms. One M&M from 10 is 10%, so the equivalent sample size from 200 would be 20. Let's randomly select 20. So comparing our results, it actually appears that they are fairly similar. It's only off by 13 percentage points, giving us an accuracy of 87%. Very interesting. The only thing we changed was the population, and comparatively, we didn't actually change the sample size. It's almost like with a larger population, an equally proportionate sample size does a better job of representing the population as a whole. Now, the larger our sample size is, the better our results will be. So let's try increasing the sample to 50. Here's our 50 M&Ms from the random sampling. Comparing it to the total and our previous run, we can see that we've done a little better, but not by much. This time we've improved by 5 percentage points. And if we do it all again, except this time with 100 M&Ms, we once again improve, but the amount that we improve is decreased. You see, each time we increase the sample, the less improvement we make until it barely changes. So why not take all of them as a sample and eliminate anywhere here? Well, obviously in a real world setting, that would take a lot of time. And as I'm sure you're all aware, time is money. In the real world, it simply isn't realistic to have a perfect study. Now in this case, we have a small population and we've established that increasing the population allows for better results in relation to said population. So let's try taking these values and increasing them equally so that we have 10,000 MMs, while also decreasing the sample size significantly. Obviously we can't do that here, so I'm going to throw these away because I've had my filthy hands all over them. And we'll create a simulation that is to that scale. So using Excel, I was able to simulate the population of 10,000 with an equal color ratio. For our first run, we'll decrease the number to just 1% of the total population, which is 100. Doing so gives us an accuracy of 92%. Now at this point, I'd like to point out that an accuracy of 95% is what most researchers strive for. Now, just for fun, let's increase the sample size to 10% which, if you recall, is what we initially started with. Doing so gives us an accuracy of almost 97%. That's crazy. So now we understand how the population and sample size affect the end results. But how actually is the sample size for a research project calculated? Well, with a simple equation, of course. Specifically, these equations. Do you think there was some divine knowledge bestowed upon researchers after a virgin sacrifice or something? <laughs> oh, no. Now, we don't even need special math skills to find the ideal sample size either. There are plenty of online calculators that will do that for you. You just need to put in the values. Let's try it by calculating the ideal sample size for our M&Ms. So, we want an accuracy of 95%. Our margin of error will be 5%. 
And since we know that 10% of the original bag of M&Ms were red, and that's what we were testing for, the population proportion will be 10%. And finally, the population itself is 10,000. If we calculate it, we get the recommended sample size of 137. If you recall, we tried a sample size of 100 with pretty accurate results. Just for fun though, let's bump up the population to 1 million. Hmm. It seems like the recommended sample size didn't change much. It only went up by 2. I ran a few more calculations and have graphed them so we can more clearly see how the size of the population affects the recommended sample size to get a clearer picture of what's going on. Here I put in about 20 different values going from 100 to 10,000. As you can see, the change in the graph is slow at first, but rapidly increases. If the population were to go off into infinity, the recommended sample size would probably stop at about 140. Now what we just went over was a very basic form of data collection. It should be said that there are many different ways to collect data, which will require very different sample sizes. For example, studies that are merely trying to show a trend in a population rather than estimate the number of instances within said population don't really need a sample size as large as the one that we calculated. Studies like these can actually have sample sizes that are smaller than 50 individuals, which, at that point, the main question becomes where is the sample collected, and how does that affect the final result? I'm actually currently working on a research project like this, and for one trial, there will be roughly 30 individuals participating, depending on how many are willing to participate. It's small, but that's okay, because the purpose is to show a trend of behavior in people. The argument, your study, argument, idea, or whatever else is invalid because the sample size is too small is surprisingly common. It's often used when you present research for a science-based idea that that person doesn't have an argument against, which causes the person to feel cognitive dissonance, so naturally they will desperately find any excuse to dismiss the evidence presented before them. Should you ever encounter someone making this argument, the best way to respond is by simply asking them what they believe the sample size should be. They'll probably respond with something like, oh, I don't know but it should be bigger. Which at that point, you can call them out for not knowing what they're talking about. You are an idiot! Or, you can just link them this video. Let me deal with them. <laughs> it can only help me. That's why I make these videos like this. To be easily shared, improving and standing in the algorithm. Now, it wouldn't be a pure carbon video if I didn't go over examples of this argument in use, so I can prove that I'm not strawmanning the argument itself. I'll start at the place where I first heard this argument used. And that was against the trans brain studies. I've talked about these before, and a common criticism I got was some of my sources had a small sample size. That's actually why I decided to make this video three years ago. Sometimes I put videos on the back burner for a while. Don't judge me. Anyway, I've seen this argument made by both liberals and conservatives because for some reason science validating trans people is a bad thing or whatever. I had a video of both Riley J. Dennis and Steven Crowder making this exact same argument against the same research. The problem is the one made by Crowder was privated somewhere within the last few years. I still have the link to it, and I remember he was chatting with some old dude who was bald and made some comment about pro-trans research being nonsense, and Steven replied with something about the wrong brain being in the wrong body, and said, Oh, and by the way, the sample size of these studies is way too small. I think it was Andrew Calavan he was talking to, but I'm not sure. You'll just have to take my word for this. The other video made by Riley J. Dennis does exist, and... That's a ridiculously small sample size. The small sample size, tiny sample size. But the biggest problem with pretty much all of the studies you'll find on this subject is the sample size. In this video, they go over numerous studies from well-respected scientific journals, which all come to the same conclusion, that the brains of trans people resemble the gender that they identify with, rather than that of the one they were assigned at birth. Now is there something that these internet personalities know that the hundreds of credible independent scientists and researchers who actively participate in academia don't? Possibly, but that's highly unlikely. There are studies like these that do have sample sizes over 100 for each trial, but there are also ones that have less than that. The sample size is small because it doesn't need to be that big. These studies aren't trying to collect exact data or find how many trans people have brains that closely resemble the brains of their gender identity. These studies are simply trying to show that this resemblance exists, which they clearly do. I've seen research not related to the studies in question, which have sample sizes as small as 8. Am I trying to attack either of these people? No, but this opposition to research based on the misunderstanding of how research is done and sample size is worthy of criticism. Now don't worry, I have more examples to go over. On Twitter, if you search sample size is too small, you'll find plenty of people making this argument, and a lot of people talking about sports betting, I think. I found a special case that I will go over. 
This person says, please show me an academic study with a sample size of merit that is generalizable, that makes this claim. Thanks. S.J. Thompson is a fairly well-known Twitter personality, and I think she's an author or educator of some sort. If you know her, you know the headache of interacting with her. In this tweet, the claim she was responding to was about IQ averages and atheists for theists. I have seen some of these studies, and they show that generally atheists have a higher IQ. But the gap really isn't that big. The fact that she mentions the sample size tells me that she's been given studies that validate this claim. Once again, these studies are attempting to show that a trend exists rather than show what percentage of the population is. So the sample sizes are probably fine. I want to be clear that I'm not defending the claim that SJ is responding to. The research is valid, but to use it as an argument in favor of atheism, a position that I identify with, is fallacious. If you're arguing that you're better or your position is right because of your connection to a group of people arbitrarily connected by one trait, and this group is better than another group in one category based off that trait, then you're making a supremacist argument. If you see someone making this argument, calling them out is perfectly fine. You don't need to even engage with fallacious reasoning. Calling it out as argumentation that it doesn't actually make the case the person believes it does is all the refutation it needs. This video isn't about debunking fallacious reasoning, so we'll move on. This final example comes from someone whom I consider to be an excellent content creator, and I was quite surprised to see him making this argument. This example comes from Jeff Holliday, where he's critiquing a paper which shows positive results from the use of hydroxychloroquine when treating COVID-19 infected patients. In this video, he talks about the problems with the study, which there are a lot of. One of the authors was also the editor-in-chief for the journal. It was published too, which may explain why it was published within a day of being submitted. I'm not here to critique the paper, Jeff's video does a fine job of that, but around the 20 minute mark, Jeff says- Now, I, I really do need to point this out. 42 is a tiny fucking sample size. It's very, very hard in order to get a, a reasonable conclusion of such a very tiny, tiny thing. Do we need more studies on it? Sure. Is the sample size small? Certainly. Does that mean that we can just dismiss the research as bunk because of that alone? No. Like I said earlier, if the purpose of the research is to show a general trend to warrant further research, not only is a small sample size acceptable, but common. Generally speaking, in the realm of medicine, a sample size between 20 and 80 participants is pretty standard for the first trial. To give some perspective, the initial trials for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine only had 45 participants. The study in question had 42. Does Jeff believe that three people is the difference between a bad studies and groundbreaking research? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure the error is the result of Jeff's video style, which is less scripted and more a live reaction to things. I hope that if he watches this video, he understands that my criticism comes from a place of love rather than spite. I want those who I follow and associate with to be as accurate as possible in the things that they say because errors made by others can affect me and how I'm viewed. My criticism also comes from the fact that the final example I had for this video was also made private, or deleted where the person in this video said the entire Pew Research Center wasn't scientific because the sample sizes were too low. <laughs> the Pew Research Center, which often has sample sizes in the tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands. But I don't know the context of this claim, so it will be forever lost to the internet. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Have you encountered this argument? If so, how did you respond? Let me know in the comments down below. As always, all of my sources are in a document linked in the description. If you heard me say something that you think might be an error, then please, by all means, be sure to check out my sources and let me know in the comment section. I've made errors in the past, and I'm bound to make another one in the future. I'm only human after all. It's only by having you, the viewer, point out these errors that I can make this correction and be more vigilant in the future. And if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, leave me a comment and I'll respond to it in the next Backfire video. If you're new here and you enjoyed this video, then I encourage you to subscribe and turn on bell notifications so you can be notified when I upload future videos. Also, giving this video a like and sharing it really helps its placement in the algorithm, making it more likely to appear in others' feeds, which helps me a ton. You could even share it with someone making this argument. Send them to me and they can leave 80 angry comments about how the study needs to have a sample size of a million in order to be valid. <laughs> I say that as a joke, but I've had people actually do that before. I mean, it only helps me, so I've got nothing against it. Anyway, until then, once again, thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Have a wonderful day.